Yeah, so my name is Greg Kretzinger. I, I handle and work with a lot of uh, our agricultural companies that are using Planet Data. Um, and so today I want to walk through um, the, an agenda, which is just an overview of Planet Satellite Data. And then I'll talk about some of the traditional use cases that we've had for satellite data in agriculture and specifically. And then I wanna go into some new use cases that I think are particularly interesting. Okay, so let's talk a little bit uh, about Planet. Planet images the whole world every day. And our three goals are really to make change visible, accessible, and what's more key is actionable. So you can visualize all of the information, um, we can provide it to users, but it's really around what decisions can I make around imagery? That's a, that's a key aspect of making use uh, of imagery. Here, I'm gonna show you just a quick video of our constellation. So our, our main constellation uh, is our Dove satellites. And there, these are small satellites, uh, so that, you know you could pick them up and carry them around. Um, they're do they're in a sun synchronous orbit, so here you can see them, um, and they're actually acting like a line scanner around the Earth. So they're taking pictures roughly around solar noon. They're always on, and they're at three meter uh, resolution, and they have different bands. Uh, right now we're at RGB and NIR, but we actually. Um, uh, have more bands than that on our new su newest super dose. We also have a high resolution product uh, called SkySat, which we have 21 of those satellites orbiting, and those are at 50 centimeters. Now those are TAS satellite products, um, so they're not always on just scanning the entire Earth every single day. Um, they're more for uh, more precise targeting. Once you look at some of the general patterns, detect some change you can task a satellite to get those 50 centimeter higher resolution images. So here are Planet products. We have a range of different products, but the key one is Planet Scope monitoring off to the left. So that's that always on monitoring from our super doves. And so that's scanning the earth and that's available uh, and basically streamed in for, for daily imagery. And that's um, really, to me, I, I mean, I'm biased because I work in agriculture, but I feel like Planet was built for ag. Like, daily imagery of the, of the Earth's landmass is just a key ag agricultural product. We combine uh, those scenes that are collected from Planet Scope uh, and we create base maps. So we have uh, global coverage of these base maps and that takes the best pixels for uh, a quarter or a month or a week and combines them together into, into a map. And to me, that's a, that's a useful product for looking and really detecting change over time and visualizing it as a base map. We also have our SkySat tasking, which is that uh, higher resolution tasking that I talked about. And then I'll talk a little bit about some of our newest products, which is around Fusion, which is um, a cloud-free, uninterrupted daily radio, radiometrically consistent data product. Uh, so that all means basically we're tracking every single day in a model or a, a data analytic product uh, these fusion tiles, which really track the phenology of the entire growing season um, at a very high level. It's a very next level product. You can access our data uh, through, so we have user interfaces. So we have our Planet Explorer web app that you can log into and you can load up your field and you can look for all the available imagery. We also have plugins with some of uh, the available GIS software like QGIS or Esri products like ArcGIS. And then you can also create your own data pipelines that flow directly into your apps. So we have customers that use our data API, which allows you to search our entire catalog. Orders API, which allows you to customize how you wanna order and pipe in the imagery. Or we also have a newer subscriptions API, which is basically, let me take my field and let me plop it down on in, as an area of interest. And you just automatically deliver data to me, I don't have to create an order and, and search for the data. It just says, here's my field. Why don't you send me everything as it, as it comes about? So that's a little bit of a rundown. That's kind of the standard breakdown of Planet products. Um, I wanna go through some of the traditional use cases now uh, for satellite data. So in general, when we're starting to think about remote sensing, you know, we've been using remote sensing and ag for a long time. Um, but Planet Data has a particular edge in terms of where our strengths are at and how it applies to 
um, to satellite data in ag. And, and in particular, we have that 24 hour daily monitoring. And this is important and really gives us a competitive edge in regions where there's high cloud cover. Um, for example, in, in Latin America, where it's, it's tropical, uh, it's really cloudy, you want to get that uh, information um, in when you're trying to do a, a lot of different management applications. And so if you're just relying on publicly available data and it happens to hit cloudy days, you're getting further and further gaps in between when you can get your imagery and Planet solves that by having that high cadence. And so here you can see, this is just an example of, of one area in Nebraska. Um, you can see this is Landsat 8 and Sentinel. Uh, and you can, you can see that there's a lot of gaps in the imagery due to clouds compared to um, planet's temporal resolution, which is gonna be able to really fill in uh, some of those gaps and give you a better chance to capture an image. And that's that can be important when you're trying to make timely decisions that you're not going a long time in between images. So the temporal resolution also is important when we think uh, uh, really when we're thinking globally as well. So um, we know that more and more there's connectedness within uh, the global agriculture supply chain. And so having that frequency and being able to capture imagery at that global scale, um, especially with the cloud issues uh, becomes increasingly important as you deal within crops or across different varieties of crops. Um, and I think as we continue moving forward, it'll become more and more important. So that's the cadence. That's one of the key aspects of Planet. Um, one of our other strengths then is going to be our resolution for agriculture, including for small scale farms. So here are smallholder farms. So Sentinel data is at about a 10 meter resolution. And what that means is if you look at a given pixel size, the smallest unit that you can see in the pixel, pixel to the farthest left, it's going to be about 10 meters on each side. So 30 by 30 feet or so. Um, so a fairly coarse resolution. Planet's at three meter intervals. And so that allows you to really see at higher resolution within a given field. Um, and then even higher at satellite, uh, at SkySat data, which is about a half a meter resolution. And so you're really getting finer and finer scale. And at some point you would have to move towards uh, aircraft or, or drone imagery to get much finer scale resolution. So uh, this basically allows us to do a lot of in-field variability monitoring. And so we have a lot of partners and, and customers that are doing this. They're taking our data and they're actually, you're able to map much more precisely within a field where that variability would be and do management zones and other uh, typical applications. So uh, as well as directed scouting. So if you're seeing issues in a field, then you can move and, and basically make decisions um, at a much finer scale and you can do that uh, remotely. So whether that's uh, disease infestation and trying to track that or whether it's applications um, or different seeding regimes, then you're able to really look at your field as, as a whole and see it from the sky and be able to see it uh, daily as needed to, to see how that variability is changing uh, based on your management decisions as well as throughout the growing season. We can also detect issues like uh, failures in irrigation systems or applicators or clog nozzles or other things like that. You're able to see that variability um, pretty well through that three meter resolution data. We have a lot of interest as well in, in cross classification. So this is getting back to that kind of smallholder farms and thinking about different crops grown uh, across the world, um, but at that smallholder farm scale and what they're growing and how that's changing um, both locally up to regionally or uh, even at the country level. So there's a lot of interest there um, in tracking crops. Um, we have a lot of interest in governments as well as the ag agencies that are thinking about um, how growers are performing and what they're growing and how that's changing from uh, year to year or growing season to growing season. So that's kind of the three key aspects. So, uh, so it's really uh, daily monitoring that resolution and then the ability to scale. So as I said before, uh, we're monitoring the entire Earth's land mass every single day and you're able to scale that compared to say, I'm trying to use a drone. I was in the drone industry for a long time. And, you know, if I can map a couple thousand acres 
on a day, I was doing pretty good. That was a really good day. Well, we're doing millions and millions of acres. Um, and so you're able to scale those applications up to a global level very easily using satellites um, and, and overcome some of those challenges with clouds that have been traditional within the remote sensing space. I also like to think about our data uh, throughout the growing season. So we have different applications and these are the fairly traditional applications of precision ag throughout the growing season. So everything from early season operations. So thinking about uh, seeding or variable, variable rate applications, um, thinking about crop management at kind of the peak season. Um, so monitoring crop health uh, or thinking about early detection of disease, for example, or, or uh, uh, weed, weeds and then directed scouting. So saving you from, you know, you're driving around a field, you're only seeing the edges of the field. Um, seeing it from the air gives you that fuller or complete picture uh, of a given field or a given farm or even a given, uh, you know, province or, or country. And then at, towards the end of the season, as we look at, at dry down and harvesting, so thinking about how you plan for harvesting and, and manage it, um, as well as planning for it next year. So looking at your productivity for the year, um, and then planning for the following growing season. So there's a lot of those different kind of traditional applications that we've been talking about um, in applying remote sensing for, for a long time within ag. Um, and so we're just seeing that really come to fruition uh, as planet has become more mature with our constellations. Um, it's really exciting to see how our users are really applying it at scale. Uh, and, and really piping in all of the data that we have to these various applications throughout the year. So it's the same imagery, planet scope imagery, but it's being used at multiple stages uh, throughout the growing season. So to me, that's really, it's really interesting. It's one of the reasons I, I joined planet uh, is to really be a part of applying and, and maturing the satellite in the industry um, today. So I wanna take some time and walk through the new use cases of our data. Um, and I think this is, these are opportunities um, within the satellite space to, to really apply it in new ways. We've talked a little bit about the traditional use cases of directed scouting and variable rate and management zones. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about uh, some of the new ways, and then I'll get into some of the future directions of, of where Planet is headed next. So here are, are, are a range of use cases that I'm going to walk through, um, and uh, we'll see how much time we have. I, I definitely want to spend time at the end going through questions, um, because there, there's a lot of questions around the application of, of our imagery, um, so let's make sure that, that we stay on time there. So when we think about high cadence time series data, I, I think where our imagery really could be applied is improving yield estimations. Um, and this is really thinking about the traditional models around forecasting and, and yield predictions. Um, and here I, I show data from a paper. Um, this is basically running simulations and looking at yields uh, under different aspects of of these different simulations around LAI, which is the leaf area index. It's one of many vegetation indices that can correlate with biomass um, of your plants. And so here we can run the simulations and we can do that at the beginning of the season, but we can also keep running them throughout the growing season and feeding in the existent data and looking at how that affects our predictions of the end of the year yield. And so I think training these models and using our data and feeding it in and seeing how that regular cadence and, and that higher resolution data uh, and the variability really impacts the simulation and really dials in the model predictions. Off to the right here, I show you two different graphs. And this is using NDVI, which is a fairly standard vegetation index um, that looks at reflectance off the plants. Um, but it, it's a good general metric of health for, for lots of applications. It's not perfect uh, uh, for everything, but it's one of those indices that you see fairly commonly in, in uh, the agricultural space. On the top, you'll see uh, the cadence of imagery that you're getting from Landsat and Sentinel, those free data points. And on the bottom, you'll see a new product from Planet called Planet Fusion. 
And this is going to get you those daily points. And you can see it really smooths out the curve and the trajectory throughout the year of NDVI as, as we look throughout that growing season. And so what that does is just give us a better consistency of data coming in um, that we can then field, feed into those yield predictions and estimations. And this can be important for a range of different applications um, around forecasting and, and pricing of given crops. So I want to run through Fusion and kind of what it is. Um, it's really a data science product. It's a model that runs on every single pixel within every image every single day, as well as a lot of cloud masking and things to take out the noise. Um, and it basically looks like this. So here's Planet Scope data on this calendar. Um, and so what it does is it basically smooths it out. We'll see if my slides are, are lagging just a little bit. Um, It'll smooth it out in terms of the trajectory that, there it goes. Uh, and this is what fusion monitoring looks like. So this is a model from one day to the next that's based on real imagery. It's not just, uh, uh, it's not just fake pixels, um, but it's basically take planning scope data and filling in uh, and smoothing on the days that we don't have an image and then calibrating that radiometrically. Um, we calibrate it to Sentinel data. And then take out all the clouds and cloud masking into this function. And, and this is basically, here's a, uh, a view of what that looks like. So this is the daily imagery going throughout the growing season of one location with Fusion applied. These are large uh, tiles. It's, so it's not cropped to any particular field, but it's basically a tile where every pixel is running that model. I'll play it again. Um, so it's really a data science product. Um, that's available and being used um, primarily by agronomic scientists that are trying to really look at the impact of how, if we can track the phenology better of given crops through time, how does that influence a lot of these applications around agronomic decisions, research, and then aspects like, like yield predictions. So I think as a next generation product, I think it'll be particularly important. So, and this is, goes along with tracking crop phenology. So here I'm showing a, a figure of NDVI through time. Um, and so we can look at the different stages of the crop and looking at phenology is often fairly important for thinking about those agronomic decisions. So things like uh, inputs or, or applications that we might be providing throughout the growing season and where timing can be really important in those decisions in terms of the effectiveness of how you're really applying uh, applying your decision making. So being able to smooth out and look at the trajectories and the shapes of those curves um, in better ways and, and how our decisions affect not just any given point, but the overall shape and trajectory throughout the growing season is, is really interesting. And there's a lot of uh, different applications that I think are there and that we're seeing come out um, in the literature now. So we published on, on this and other researchers are publishing around the application of fusion for, for these uh, research questions around phenology in, in different crops, in different locations, at different times of year, et cetera. So one of the pain points in using imagery in ag is ex extracting field boundaries. And so what I wanted to just bring that up, you know, fields change from year to year. I mean, I live in California. We have fields changing even within a year as they rotate out for, for different annual crops. Um, so you might be growing, you know, lettuce in one part of the year and then switch over to something else uh, at a different part of the year in, in the Salinas Valley, for example, um, which is close to, to where I live in the Bay Area. So extracting those field boundaries and accurately, I think, is one future uh, direction that I see for the use of satellite data that would be beneficial and automating that process so you don't have to go in and manually draw them or upload a shape file or some kind of boundary um, and continue to do that if your field boundaries are changing from one year to the next, for example. Uh, another important aspect is to look at green up and so and look at planting and, and harvesting dates. So when we think about um, tracking different management practices throughout the growing season. In the past, what we did is basically look at when there was green up enough that we could detect it in the satellite data and then back calculate when that planting date might have been. And that can be important for, for a lot of different applications. Um, but I think that really with the frequency and the cadence of CubeSats 
uh, the cube satellites like like PlanetScope, I think that we're better able to identify basically down to the day of when that field was planted um, and be able to track those patterns in a given different region um, as well as harvest. And so I think that's a, a really important future application uh, of our imagery. This is one of uh, my favorite applications, mostly because I like to put pictures of cows up. Uh, but uh, what we see in our data is, is, is a use of um, satellite imagery for thinking about forage use efficiency um, in, in grazing and being able to optimize pastures and pasture management. So the, looking at biomass of grasses can be a fairly manual process. So I have the, the little stick that you put out there and you can look at like the height of the grass and it depends on the variety and you can estimate biomass. Um, and you can do that for one pasture and another and it's, it's fairly tedious. And so being able to dial in your pastures and think about um, how you're, you know, the number of head that you're stocking in there as well as how you're rotating them around um, and being able to really optimize that and, and automate that process um, is something that's today quantifiable. So basically we have customers that are they're using this um, or they're, they're extracting those analytics for their users. And you can, you can look at the yield or the, the, the amount of biomass or, or the amount of uh, weight gain and, and see the actual changes in, in how this is optimizing that and what's the return on investment of using remote sensing. So the, uh, improving forage use efficiency, I think will continue to be an important application um, as we really scale this globally uh, for different regions, especially under different climatic regimes when we're thinking about moisture content or rainfall or uh, different types of, of animals and, and different types of pasture. Um, insurance claims, this is, this is kind of a growing area as well, especially with the high resolution uh, satellites like SkySat. So thinking about claims and how we start automating the process around claims. Um, Monitoring sustainable ag practices. So this is this is also a, a really growing area as we think about sustainability initiatives. We just had COP26 in, in Europe. Um, so just thinking about um, changing practices like till no till or cover crops and how we monitor those practices as well as reporting. Um, so thinking about um, uh, how do we, you know, Make sure that we're we're seeing those practices and uh, and we're reporting those practices in order to have them verified by different agencies, different stakeholders. Um, monitoring field trials. So I came from the drone industry, so I'm obligated to put a drone in like every single talk that I give. Um, but I think that you know field trials. I've worked a lot in field trials, and there's a lot of of pain and applications around just the tediousness of collecting really high resolution data and making sure that it, uh, uh, it is collected accurately. Um, and so um, monitoring your field trials, sampling and thinking about uh, changes at a plot level and for your different treatments, I think is an important uh, aspect of, of remote sensing data. And I, I believe that Drones are really important for small scale, really high resolution phenology measurements, for example, or phenotyping. But I think satellite data can complement a lot of um, basically um, a lot of the measurements and the automation of, of the processes that, that we're seeing in, in the field trials. Um, and so it's a complementary tool. It's an important one. And I think we'll continue to see you know, it's not either a drone or a low resolution satellite, it's them working together. Also field trials, um, I think there's a lot of opportunities in, in just thinking about um, uh, field trials as our kind of set up established experiments, but we're also seeing natural experiments that occur. Um, so it's, you know, something you might've done accidentally, um, like double applications or skipping a row, et cetera you're able to go back into our archive data because we're always on monitoring. You're able to go back and really see, um, okay, here's something that happened last year. We didn't collect any data on it, but can we go back into Planet's archive because they have all of the daily imagery going back years. Um, we can still extract that information. It's there, it wasn't lost. Um, and I think that that's an interesting application as well. 
And so that's it. Uh, we're also hiring a ton. So you can go to planet.com and, and look at all the jobs that are being posted. There's new p- faces popping up at Planet every week. Um, so I encourage you if, you, if you're interested in the plant sciences, remote sensing, sales, any of those jobs, um, feel free to reach out to me at, at Gregory at planet.com. Hi, Gregory. Thanks for that presentation. Yeah, thank you. I'll, I'll just reiterate that if you uh, if you need a referral for those jobs, just put me down as a referral. Uh, I'm happy to talk to people. It's about Planet hiring. Uh, there's lots of incentive to hire and motivate, uh, get good folks here at Planet. Fantastic. There's a lot of great people in the uh, GoGematics network and in the Canadian geospatial community uh, writ large. Um, Uh, Maybe your team wants to post some things in our Slack for that, as well as the chat. That would be very helpful. So we've got some time for Q&A. People uh, put your questions in the Q&A. I will read them out. I wanted to start off uh, with a question uh, that I had. I was thinking about what you were talking about in terms of the service and the data for agriculture. Uh, we have quite a few um, federal and provincial municipal folks in the audience. Uh, in terms of what they would be looking for uh, in terms of agriculture, could you maybe define that a bit more as, as opposed to the difference between agricultural companies? Sure. I think there's a lot of overlap there in the tools, but um, one of the big directives that we're seeing right now um, that, that's transferable over to kind of state, local, and, and federal governments is really thinking about sustainability initiatives. And so, uh, you know, as we scale to, to feed a, a growing population around the globe, there's a lot of push around sustainability, particularly in carbon and carbon markets and, and really tracking that around rules and regulation. And so we need to think about, um, you know, there's a lot of hype around sustainability, but they're really getting that good tangible metrics of like, how are we gonna measure this? How are we gonna enforce some of these initiatives? Um, I think in agriculture and and thinking about practices, how do we monitor practices and how do we do that over uh, at scale for an entire province or an entire region? Um, I think that's where Planet's always on monitoring as well as our archives. So we go back, you know, years for a given field and you can really look at those changes uh, in your area over time of how those practices are changing. And then if you're introducing new rules and regulations and enforcing those, you can see it at how well that enforcement is actually working. So I think that there's a lot of opportunities there around sustainability initiatives um, that aren't just touchy feely, that are real and and growing and should be paid attention to. Thanks. And uh, I forgot to reiterate, uh, we're so happy to have Planet with us as a gold sponsor supporting this event, keeping us free. Um, So thanks for that. A question in from the audience. Uh, It starts with, uh, thank you for the presentation. I want to know how we can improve uh, yield estimation using other information from remote sensing. And what can we say about simple techniques that are also using remote imagery, but traditional techniques, I think is what he was trying to say. Yeah, I mean, So the world of ag tech is full of big data, right? And so I think remote sensing is really just one tool there, but there's a lot going on in agriculture that's combining um, a lot of ground data or weather data, um, even just boots on the ground, um, uh, monitoring inspection, soil sampling, things like that. So I think the future is really combining those data layers together from like very manual processes to a more automated remote processes um, to get a better picture of, of, uh, how production is going, better forecasting, better pricing. Um, but, you know, remote sensing is one piece of that picture. As much as I would like it to be the, the golden hammer that, that solves all solutions, I think really the future is combining those layers together most effectively for a given crop in a given location uh, at a given time of year. And that's very different for, for different practices and different, different crops, different species, and different regions. So I think it's a little more n- nuanced there around it's not just about the picture it's also about how you combine it with information you already know uh, to make the most effective decisions fantastic we got another question 
Suppose you have very precise LIDAR DEM, DTM data. What can be the most accurate ortho from three meters resolution data? What RMSE can you achieve? Yeah, that's a pretty technical question. Um, I would, this is kind of an over beers uh, question with the technical team that I'd have to follow up on. I know Cassidy's no in there as well um, and, and uh, can address some of that. Uh, he's, he's a PhD remote sensing scientist on our sales team. Um, and I think he's, he's got that handled. I think, you know, to me that the elevation data um, uh, and the volume metrics, I think is, is something that um, uh, there's a lot of future and a lot of potential there. I'm in California, so particularly for tree crops or, or some of the other uh, nut crops, thinking about volume metrics of, of canopies is something that uh, we're interested in and in, in working with some of our science partners as, as well in, in academia and some of the ag extension programs to really think about. Thanks. Uh, there's what looks like maybe another uh, technical question. Don't know if you want to take this one. Can you reach a 1.5 meter um, subpixel ortho accuracy? Yeah, I think let's. I'll, I'll defer again to Cassidy and the sales team there on the on the positional accuracy. I will say that we've just so today we uh, we announced actually our eight band uh, announcement. Oh, so we're fully released eight band. Uh, for Planet, Planet Scope Super Doves, and there we've made um, uh, tremendous improvements on the band-to-band -band alignment that will really help some of our accuracy me measurements, both from a radiometric uh, standpoint as well as positionally. Um, but I'm not sure exactly on the uh, the one and a half meter, the so subpixel ortho accuracy. You've got a workshop coming up uh, on um, on March 4th, so this week, and the topic of it, of which is monitoring invasive plant species using the eight band data. So I, I'd invite everyone who's got some uh, technical questions, we'll take a deeper dive. That's gonna be long form content. Can you uh, preview a little bit of the workshop at all? What's gonna be covered? Yeah, I mean, I for me, um, uh, invasive species, you know, they're the second greatest threat to biodiversity on the on the earth uh, after climate change. And, and they cause billions of dollars of, of, of damage every, year. So actually tracking the phenology of invasive species for early detection or thinking about spread, as well as the efficacy of treatments and eradication. So how does the recovery of an ecosystem happen? Um, I think that that planet scope monitoring has been shown to be very effective at that. So I'm, uh, I think that workshop will dive in deeper about like, hey, here's a major problem, um, whether it's it's grasses or, or shrubs or other other species. How do we detect them? How do we identify um, the, the shape of the phenology throughout the growing season, and then how do we think about eradication and, and um, being most efficient in the resources that we apply to, to invasives. So I think uh, having the eight scope, eight, eight band planet scope data there, particularly the red edge. So, so I deal with vegetation mapping all the time, that addition of the red in, in DBI, for example, when you're thinking about just the red band and, and near infrared. So having the red edge addition, I think, uh, will be an important uh, uh, benefit for 2022 and beyond. Oh, fantastic. Okay, so we've gone into our next break already. So we're going to uh, cut it short here. Thank you so much, Greg. And thank you to the planet team for putting this together. Yeah, thanks for having us. Uh, thank you very much. So coming up after the break, we're going to be here with another gold sponsor, uh, SafeGraph, who's going to be talking about accurate geospatial analysis. So I'll see you all on the other side of the break. <laughs>